Uh, I don't think I need to go through any of the uh, housekeeping stuff. I think you're all aware of it. Or do I? Has everybody heard the housekeeping? Um, okay. Um, Mike, Mike Foster today is uh, going to give us a talk. Hello. Um, <laughs> Won't be saying that in a minute. <laughs> Rolling your eyes and tossing. Did you bring him along with you? <laughs> no, we're fine. Okay, Mike's going to be talking about the crisis uh, in the welfare state. He's going to be looking at uh, uh, the situation as we find it at the present time and uh, looking forward into the future. So I don't think I need to say any further more about that. Mike? Yeah, right. Thank you very much. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mike. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> don't set me off. Uh, <laughs> uh, when the British welfare state was established in the 1940s, its apparent aim was to improve the, health, improve the health and well-being of the population. Behind this was the intention that the working class would be more productive if supported by social institutions like the NHS and what's now called the Department for Work and Pension. <laughs> These would support workers when they became ill or reached a certain level of poverty until they were able to return to the active workforce. In the following decades, the range of support services expanded considerably and now includes counsellors, advisors, tenancy support workers, drug workers, sheltered housing schemes, among many others. Most of these services are carried out not directly by the state, but by charities, housing associations and care providers commissioned by local or national government. So, Rather than just discussing the services provided directly by the state, I'll also be covering other aspects of the wider support industry. (coughs) What I'm particularly interested in is how the economic crisis is shaping the culture within support services. And by this I mean how these changes affect those working in support services as well as those receiving help from them. My talk will be in two halves. The first will cover some aspects of the benefit system, but but not all. Uh, I won't be saying anything about housing benefit or child benefit, for example. For the second half, it would have been the obvious step to discuss changes in the NHS, especially the reforms which were planned and have now been shelved. Instead, I'll cover some aspects of support services which haven't been reported much in the media. So um, don't expect my talk to be a definitive guide to how support services and and the extended welfare state have been affected by the economic crisis. Uh, you'd, you'd have to put up with my voice for hours on end if I, if I tried that. But uh, if, there's th- if there's things that we, um, I don't cover, then um, we can always you know, uh, go into those in the discussion afterwards. Okay. Around uh, 5.67 million people of working age in Great Britain ca- claim benefits of some kind or another to supplement either having no or low wages. That's around 14.5% of the population. Recently, there's been more demonisation of those who claim benefits. The BBC produced two programmes, uh, one called On the Fiddle and another one called Saints and Scroungers, which uh, report on fraudulent claims. And in May, the government released details of some of the outlandish reasons people have given for claiming benefits. Examples include, it wasn't me working, it was my identical twin, and I had no idea my wife was working, I never noticed her leaving the house twice a day in a fluorescent jacket and a stop children's song. (laughs) Uh, This report was released knowing full well it would be used as tabloid fodder. Indeed, the quotes above come from an article in the Sun newspaper. This type of journalism ostensibly draws attention to how those claiming benefits will be checked by fraud investigators. But the effect that it has is to exaggerate the number of fraudulent benefit claims, which are estimated to be only about 1% of the total. These reports could also be used to spread the message that those claiming benefits don't really deserve to, and if this, attitude, if this attitude spreads, then it'll be easier for people to accept cuts to benefit payments. <coughs> so, since the economic crisis started, it's been increasingly difficult to maintain a benefit claim. This is for at least three reasons. Firstly, that the government wants to prevent having to pay out an increasing amount in benefits to people who have lost jobs in recession-hit workplaces. Secondly, the government wants to reduce the number of people already claiming benefits as part of its spending cuts. 
In 2009, the government estimated that it paid out nearly £90 billion in benefits and a further £974 million in related admin costs. And thirdly, reducing the number of people claiming benefits can be publicised to give the impression that the economy is improving. So, to reduce the number of people claiming benefits, the criteria for being eligible for them has been tightened up. Any breaches of these could lead to your benefits stopping for up to six months, if you can claim them in the first place. And uh, this strict uh, change of approach by the government has led to some brutal practices. Uh, just over two and a half billion people in Britain claim ESA. This is the name of the benefit which is replacing incapacity benefit. And it stands for uh, Employment and Support Allowance, with the implication that employment is the goal for those claiming it. In the same way, unemployment benefit was rebranded a few years ago to Job Seekers Allowance, to emphasise that people receiving it should be seeking jobs. To claim ESA, you need a sick note from your doctor, and then you complete an application, either over the phone or by filling in a 52-page uh, long form. Uh, funnily enough, nearly all the questions on the form are uh, about your financial circumstances. Uh, there's, there's very little on there about your actual health. There's only <coughs> one or two questions. Several months into a claim, those receiving ESA are likely to be given an appointment for a work capability assessment. And this is to determine whether or not your claim can continue. At these assessments, uh, a doctor checks how your health affects what you can and can't do. For example, uh, you're tested on whether you can raise at least one of your arms above head height. That's one of the questions. Uh, another one is whether or not you can pick up and move an empty cardboard box or cope with small and unexpected changes to your routine, such as a, a bus being late. Now, unsurprisingly, a lot of people have been judged fit for work following one of these assessments. Uh, even when they have a severely limiting uh, medical condition. By focusing on the tasks that nearly everyone would be able to do, the questions ignore more significant problems which would prevent someone from working. For example, uh, the test covers whether you can move more than 200 metres along flat ground. Now, someone might be able to do this, but it doesn't equate to all the toing and froing, walking uh, and, and at movement involved in a, a full day's work. Or, if you have uh, fits or blackouts less than once a month, you could be deemed fit for work. But this doesn't necessarily mean that an employer would want to take on someone who's prone to having blackouts. And the decision made after this 20 minute or so assessment overrules that of your own doctor who may have got to know your medical circumstances over many years. The company which carries out these assessments on behalf of the state <coughs> is called Atos Healthcare. According to their website, and I'll, uh, and I'll quote, we utilise our expertise in consulting technology and healthcare to continually drive innovation through one integrated world-class offering, uh, which gives you some kind of idea what kind of organisation they are. The website says that each year they carry out over 800,000 face-to-face medical assessments across 140 examination centres. <coughs> And according to its own documents, uh, 29 of these assessment centres uh, aren't wheelchair accessible and uh, 16 are more than five minutes walk away from the nearest bus or train station. So if you've got limited mobility, even being able to attend the appointment could mean you're condemning yourself to having your benefits stopped. It's expected that hundreds of thousands of claimants will stop getting ESA following one of these assessments. It's harder to quantify the amount of stress and fear that people will suffer when having to deal with their income being taken away, especially on top of having to cope with whatever medical condition they've got. You can appeal if your benefits are stopped, and because of a huge backlog of appeals, you'd be waiting for well over a month to have your uh, appeal looked at. During this time, you can still claim ESA, but at the, at the lowest rate, which is uh, £67.50 a week if you're over 25. Uh, so th this could mean a reduction of around £25 a week if you're a, a long-term claimant. The DWP, uh, that's uh, the Department Depart Depart for Works and Pensions, they, they expect 40% uh, of those appealing to win their appeal and remain on ESA afterwards, which uh, shows that they don't have much faith in Atos's accuracy. So, if your ESA claim is stopped because you're judged medically fit for work and your appeal fails, then you'll probably have to join those claiming JSA. The number of people in Britain claiming job seekers allowance is around 1.3 million. 
The amount you receive is usually 67.50 a week if you're over 25, or 53 pounds 45 if you're under 25. If you're on JSA or ESA, then you're also eligible for some other benefits, such as housing benefit and council tax benefit to cover uh, to cover rent. A whistleblower told the Guardian newspaper about new policies adopted at the job centre where he worked. <coughs> Staff had to aim for a target of identifying three JSA claimants each week who could have their benefits stopped or, or sanctioned. That, that's, the, that's the official word. To claim JSA, you have to attend a job centre at least once a fortnight and provide proof of what jobs you've looked for. It is quite easy to do this. So in many cases, job centre staff are encouraged to use underhand tactics in order to reach their quota of stock claims. For example, someone claiming JSA who was known to be dyslexic was asked to provide written proof of their efforts to find work. And when they couldn't provide this, their benefits were suspended. Another tactic is for a job centre advisor to book uh, what's called an enhanced interview with someone. But uh, they, uh, an enhanced interview is just a bit more in-depth where the, the advisor will go into a bit more detail about what kinds of work to apply for and what, what could be done in theory to help you find work. So the other tactic is to book one of these enhanced interviews with someone on the day that they normally sign on, but a couple of hours earlier. Uh, the job centre advisor would then post out a letter informing the claimant of the enhanced interview appointment but they'd send it out hoping to time it so that they receive the letter after the actual appointment date. So uh, when the claimant arrives at their normal signing on time, unaware that they've already missed the earlier appointment, then their claim gets stopped. Yet another method, there's, there's loads of these methods by the way, I hope there's no sneaky nasty JSA advisors who are, who are taking notes and uh, use these <laughs> to stop anyone's benefit claim, that, that, that's certainly a case of my So yeah, yeah, another tactic of getting someone to get their JSA stopped is for the job centre advisor to encourage, encourage someone who's skilled in a particular trade, such as plumbing for example, to apply for other jobs, like working in a call centre. And then if the claimant doesn't apply for call centre jobs, then that's another reason for stopping their JSA. Uh, I know people who, whose benefits have been stopped because they've arrived at the job centre just a, a couple of minutes late, it's, it's getting that strict. Uh, and someone else reported that their JSA claim was stopped when they couldn't provide evidence that they had posted off a job application. Statistics from the Department of Work and Pensions show the total number of cases where people have had their JSA suspended for varying lengths of time increased by 40% between April and October last year. Uh, I couldn't get figures that are more up to date, but I'm guessing it's sort of accelerated a bit since then. And the whistleblower said that it's easier to target those who have lacked education opportunities, who have learning difficulties, or who are new to the system. In many cases, these would be people less likely to find work anyway, and who will probably be claiming benefits for the longest. The whistleblower also reported competition to reach targets for the number of claims stopped. A board in the back office of the job centre showed how many sanctions each <coughs> member of staff had made, um, encouraging comparisons between how well staff are doing. And this competition extended between job centres. According to the whistleblower, and, and I quote, we were told suddenly that stopping a claim once a week wasn't good enough. We were far behind other offices. And we went to a meeting where they compared us with other offices and said we now have to do three a week to catch up. Most staff go into work and they're thinking about it from moment one. Who am I going to stop this week? The ethos is that job centre staff are saving taxpayers money and by extension their own money by <coughs> doing this. The whistleblower said, saving the public purse is the catchphrase that is used in our office. It is drum time all the time, you're saving the public purse. Feel good about stopping someone's money, you've just saved your own pocket. Here um, it seems the, the authorities are trying to tap into what they think is some um, residual wartime uh, spirit, um, I'm assuming, of, of all of us pulling together to get the country out of the economic crisis. But more likely this, this ethos will just make job centres even more depressing places to, to work and visit. Job centre advisors have said that this new approach is eroding the kind of working relationship they aimed for with, uh, with the benefit claimants that they deal with. They feel that they're in the job to support the claimant with finding work. And this means knowing their strengths and weaknesses and building up trust. But if the new goal of this relationship is for the advisor to use their knowledge of the claimant to try and catch them out, 
then this rapport will be lost. Perhaps aware of the effects of their new policies, the DWP has released guidelines for job centre staff of how to deal with claimants who threaten suicide. Sorry, so it's rather grim for a first thing in the morning, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah. The new policy states, <coughs> some customers may say they intend to self-harm or kill themselves as a threat or tactic to persuade, others will mean it. It is very hard to distinguish between the two. For this reason, all declarations must be taken seriously. But uh, it is not clear what the guidelines would tell you if you're actually faced with a suicidal person, though. But although these guidelines may sound shocking, they could be seen as the DWP just being realistic and uh, responding to a growing problem. Across Europe, most countries have seen an increase in suicide rates since the economic crisis took hold. The UK saw a rise of 10% to six and three quarter suicides on average per 100,000 people. Also, the, the economic crisis has seen use of antidepressants becoming more widespread. Prescriptions of antidepressants have risen by more than 40% over the past four years. Regarding the advice to be prepared for threats of suicide, the whistleblower said, we've suddenly got this new aspect to our job. The bigger picture is people here are wondering how savage these cuts are going to be, and we're the frontline staff having to deal with the fallout from these changes. <clears throat> now in that quote, the whistleblower used the term frontline staff. And this phrase is often used to describe roles like nurses, social workers, teachers. And as we know, the phrase usually refers to those below senior management level who deal directly with people in some kind of need. The implication is that you're fighting on the front line of society's problems. However, the, the military metaphor is more accurate if you remember what front line means in a real battle. Front line soldiers are those sent into risky situations by authority figures who are usually far away from the conflict. The soldiers aren't in a position to make decisions based on their direct experience of the war. And because those in authority are removed from the situation, their decisions about how it should be handed, are handled are based on vested interests and self-preservation rather than genuine concern. The higher up the ranks you are, the more distant you are from those affected by the decisions you make. And this makes it easier to make decisions which negatively affect someone. As a result, the soldiers on the front line bear the brunt of the war and feel trapped by their inability to change anything fundamental. And it's the same in our hospitals, schools and support services. Where most staff aren't able to make decisions based on what's actually needed because of unrealistic dictates from above. Frontline staff are really just cannon fodder to protect those in charge from society's problems. And as the economic crisis continues, frontline staff will increasingly find themselves as scapegoats for failings in the system. To put it another way, uh, the, the, the dynamic is a bit like that of an abusive relationship. The frontline member of staff is under the sway of a dominant party who restricts their freedom of speech and movements. Next, we'll see how the different perspective of those in charge has affected one particular section of the support services industry. <clears throat> One government initiative you don't hear much about on the news is supporting people. This programme started in 2003 and was intended to streamline the way that funding is allocated to what's called housing-related support. And by this, it is meant support to help people gain the opportunities and skills needed to live independently. So types of support could, could include uh, advice about benefits or debts, basic skills classes, or a help with paperwork like uh, housing application forms. But uh, in practice, it could pretty much mean any kind of assistance which uh, wouldn't be given in a medical or an educational setting. <coughs> and this support could be provided through advice centres, home visits to vulnerable people, or residential schemes like homeless hostels, shared houses for people unable to live independently, or homeless hostels. Did I repeat that? Or, or uh, sheltered housing schemes for people above retirement age as well. The government estimates that at any one time, around a million people receive assistance through a supporting people funded service. More than three quarters of these people would be above retirement age. Others would be people who are homeless, have mental health problems or be at risk of domestic violence. 
Supporting people had an annual budget of around 1.64 million, billion, sorry, uh, billion pound, 1.64 billion, which is uh, allocated through local councils to other agencies that each council commissions to run services. So in a way, um, the way that supporting people funding is allocated is sort of analogous to the way that NHS funding is often allocated. With, with the NHS, uh, around 80% of its money is allocated through local primary care trusts, although all of that's going to change. So in the NHS, the primary care trust would uh, commission services from non-NHS um, organisations. It's the same with supporting people. So a lot of supporting people funded projects, uh, things like housing associations or, or certain kinds of charities. Since the Supporting People programme was introduced, support services have become ludic ludicrously bureaucratic. For example, um, imagine that you work in a sheltered housing scheme for older people and one of the residents' alcohol use increases. It's affecting their health in, they can't, in that they can't handle the drink as well as they used to. And it's affecting their finances as well as um, they're spending money on booze that they'd otherwise spend on, on food or bills. Before the Supporting People programme was introduced, um, not, not that it was perfect before supporting people, but before the, the Supporting People programme was introduced, you would deal with this by referring them to a, a GP or an alcohol agency and helping them plan out their spending better with a, a few notes on their, on their records to show what you've done. These days, you would also have to complete an assessment of the customer's needs and potential risks if those needs are not met. Then you would use the assessment as a basis for a risk management plan and also a support plan as records of what support should be put in place. Any changes in circumstances should involve updates to their assessment and support plan, which should be reviewed at least every few months. In this example, as the person's alcohol use is affecting their finances and health, then you would update the pages of both their assessment and support plan that relate to their economic well-being, physical health and substance misuse. But you might also amend the sections on their mental health, personal care and relationships if these were affected by their alcohol use. And you need to keep copies of any budgeting plans made to help them manage their money better and the referral to the alcohol support agency. The argument in favour of the supporting people method is that it aims to ensure that adequate support is provided and that the best way of doing this is regularly updated assessments and support plans, evidencing what has been done. Internal and external audits would determine whether the support provided and recorded is adequate. All this is fine in theory, but in practice, the workloads of those working in pretty much every kind of support service have multiplied because of the paperwork. And because the paperwork has increased so much, there isn't time to do everything that you should be doing, like uh, helping people. The act of recording what you're doing has become more important than what you're doing and whoever you're doing it for. So, the, the, to put it in sort of Marxist terms, the, the paperwork has been fetishised. And this can be explained by how the paperwork is used to measure outcomes. Sorry. Whenever I hear the word outcomes, I, I, I suddenly get palpitations and a horrible buzzing feeling in my head, it's uh, well, conditioned to, uh, to loathe that word. <coughs> so, the supporting people paperwork is used to measure outcomes. And this is the, the same kind of target obsessed culture which is uh, affecting education in particular. So, when a client leaves a support service, any progress made while receiving that support is logged and collated. For example, whether someone accessed training, whether they had more independence, whether their health improved, and so on. And these outcomes are used to measure the value of the service. Expectations of what support should be provided have risen considerably since the Supporting People programme began. So um, these days, compared with, say, 10 years ago, um, anyone working in support services would know that standards have, or expectations rather, have, have increased dramatically, which again is good in some ways, because uh, it, it, it was easier to cut corners beforehand. But, um, so yeah, expectations have risen, but that doesn't mean that the number of staff or the number of resources or number of hours in the day has increased as well. And in October 2010, the government announced that it would reduce supporting people funding by 11.5%. 
And uh, I'm a personal victim of these cuts. Um, and earlier this week, I was told that if I want to remain in my current job, then I'll have to accept a 20% pay cut, which has obviously been on my mind while I've been putting together this. So it's got a bit of extra vitriol uh, behind it, my talk. So, yeah. <laughs> so, as a consequence of all the crap that's happening in my job. But, uh, it's all grist to the mill, it's all good life experience. Right. Um, the reduction in funding and therefore services. Um, doesn't mean that the expectations will reduce as well. There's a growing number of people with support needs, especially as the average age of the population rises. The economic crisis itself is uh, causing more people to have problems which might necessitate help. So the funding cuts will mean that not, not everyone who needs help will receive it, and an increased workload for all those already struggling in support roles. In the climate of cuts, organisations which have the best outcomes are those which are more likely to get their funding renewed. So staff will be very aware of the threat of reduced funding if their paperwork isn't up to date or in enough detail. And if you've been properly indoctrinated, this threat gives you more motivation than wanting to help people in difficult situations. Uh, a consequence of becoming more and more focused on achieving positive outcomes could be that someone might be refused a service in the first place if they aren't expected to yield a positive result. For example, it's now more likely for someone to be refused a room in a homeless hostel, for example, if the staff think that the person probably won't progress. Perhaps they've got a long-term drug problem and aren't motivated to deal with it, or it would be difficult to move them into a flat because of rent arrears or ASBOs. However, it's not only those services which recall poor outcomes that are likely to get their funding cut. If an organisation records good outcomes, then its funding could still get cut if it's judged to be too expensive. Um, I'll illustrate that with an example. Um, there's an organisation called Turning Point, which is a, which is a national organisation. And it um, provides help for people with um, complex needs, including those affected by uh, drug and alcohol misuse, mental health problems, or those with a learning disability. It runs projects in 244 locations across England and Wales, and last year had contact with 130,000 people. Now, in my experience, uh, Turning Point has quickly and responsibly helped people with a history of drug problems get into training that they would otherwise not be able to access. However, in some areas, their funding has been cut, leaving a gap in services. This means that many people with drug problems won't be able to access training courses, which is often a, a crucial part of their recovery. And this means that they're less likely to overcome their drug problem and improve their skills. And this will lead to extra expenditure for drug agencies and prolonged benefit claims. So whenever you cut funding to one service, it has a, a knock-on effect on other services. Um, usually for the worst. It's like holding a water balloon. Uh, you squeeze one part of it and it just bulges out in another place. At the moment, the funding cuts to support services are, to some extent, Darwinian. It's uh, survival of the fittest, where fittest means those who can show evidence of the most positive outcomes at the cheapest rate. This ethos is only likely to increase with what's going to happen to support services around the next few years. <clears throat> back in 2007, the, gov uh, back in 2007, the government published a report called Putting People First. This paper outlined what reforms would be made to social care in England, including that funded through the Supporting People programme. The reforms were grouped together under what's known as the Personalisation Agenda. And I'll quote, uh, I'll quote from the website personalisationagenda.org.uk, which is not a government site, but the, the way that they explain it uh, uh, seems to cover it quite well. Personalisation is about putting individuals firmly in the driving seat of building a system of care and support that is designed with their full involvement and tailored to meet their own unique needs. This is a completely different approach to our historic one-size-fits-all system of individuals having to access and fit into care and support services that already exist, which have been designed and commissioned on their behalf by local authorities, for example. Individuals will receive their own budget 
and can decide how, who with and where they wish to spend that budget in order to meet their needs and achieve their desired outcomes. Whilst there is an initial focus on social care and support services, the principles of personalisation are being embedded into a range of other public service areas such as health and education. Um, that's the end of the quote. So th this new approach um, will feed itself into uh, pretty much every kind of area of society where people need some kind of, some kind of need. So th this new approach will involve individual service users being able to shop around for support services. Imagine that you need some help to live independently in a rented flat, perhaps because of a drug or alcohol problem or learning difficulties or you're a refugee. Uh, this is called tenancy support. Previously, you would have received that support from whichever council or uh, housing association owned the flat, or um, whichever other agencies worked <laughs> alongside the housing provider. The intention of the personalisation agenda is that you would be able to choose which agency provides your support, uh, rather than having that decision made for you by the housing provider. The material written about the personalisation agenda infuses that it will involve more control and choice for those needing support services. But, of course, this isn't the, isn't the full story. What the personalisation agenda will also bring in is more market-style dynamics to the support industry. Now, um, market forces already influence uh, support services, of course. Different support providers compete for government funding, for example. And, of course, to some extent, it doesn't really matter whether a service is provided by a profit-making organisation, uh, a housing association, or the state. They're, they're all capitalist organisations and subject to the same economic forces, even if um, this is <coughs> manifested in different ways according to the structure of the organisation. But the personalisation agenda will mean changes which are of relevance to those interested in how capitalism alienates people. Um, at the moment, the, the competition for funding that goes on between organisations isn't usually apparent to those using the services. Uh, the, the, sort of the competition sort of goes on behind the scenes, as it were. But what the personalisation agenda threatens is to make receiving support more like going to the supermarket. You pick and choose between different agencies selling their support, going for the ones with the most eye-catching brochures or who make the most promises. Already, service users are encouraged to think of themselves as customers uh, rather than clients or service users. And in my opinion, this, this will only increase alienation. Uh, support, whether it's from a nurse in a hospital, a counsellor or a tenancy support worker, it traditionally relies on a structured professional relationship between people. Uh, Counsellors in particular uh, place great emphasis on understanding the dynamics of their relationship with their clients. <coughs> in the decades that professional support relationships have been studied and evolved, the aim has been to encourage a relationship which works best for the client. <coughs> now, um, this is already an alienated relationship, uh, of course, to, to some extent, as it's unequal, it's, um, you know, it's, it's within professional boundaries which are to some extent embedded in, in capitalist society. But under the personalisation agenda, the relationship between customers and support staff will be um, contaminated with notions of buyer and seller. And the belief that you're only getting a service because of a financial transaction. And as I've explained, support is already treated as if it's a product. The way that supporting people outcomes are measured is intended to quantify support, which is otherwise intangible and, and a bit ghostly. Um, turning support into a quantifiable product will make it easier for it to be subject to the dynamics of the market. So the personalisation agenda is another aspect of the increasing commodification of support. But <coughs> why is the personalisation agenda being introduced? You would have thought that a shake-up, especially on quite a big scale, you would have thought that a shake-up of support services in the current economic uh, situation would involve spending the, the money that the government wouldn't want to commit to. Um, it, it's not a Tory idea. Uh, remember that the personalisation agenda was first mooted back in 2007 when uh, Labour was still in power. 
The official statements claim that the, the aim of the personalization agenda is to improve support services, but, but they would say that, wouldn't they? But um, th this improvement is hoped to come out of the, the competition that would arise between service providers. It's hoped that services will all compete to be the best so that they can secure more customers. Overall, though, the, the real aim is to reduce costs. Um, increasing competition is one way of keeping costs down as organisations will compete to provide more and more support for the money that they receive than, than other organisations can manage. So, overall, the personalisation agenda will help lead us towards a society where market forces are more blatant in support services. And th th this can only lead to people being more alienated from each other they, than they are now. And I find this worrying in an industry where most of its workers just, just want to help people. Um, I've, I've got another reason to mistrust the personalization agenda. The, the, the website I mentioned earlier, uh, it, it somehow caused my computer to crash. I mean, I lost uh, several hours worth of preparation for this talk. I'm, I'm sure it's a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to conclude, the economic crisis is leading to worrying changes in the extended welfare state. There are the more direct and obvious changes, such as restrictions on those who can claim benefits, and the cuts in support services. These will affect millions of people who are already in some kind of need, whether through a lack of money or through a health issue. But there are also changes to the culture of support services. The crisis has made it easier for those in authority to encourage workers to do things that they otherwise wouldn't want to do. I'm sure that there are many job centre staff who don't want to trick people into losing their benefits, or support staff who can see how paperwork is becoming more important than people. But with the constant threat of losing your job, either through funding cuts or refusing to toe the line, you're more likely to go with the changes, however brutal. And the personalisation agenda will introduce more blatant commercialisation into support services, where receiving help becomes more just like buying a product. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll take time now for some questions and comments. Um, thank you, Mike. I, uh, I think we all know what's going on, but it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, disturbing when you start to hear the details um, spelled yeah. out so clearly. Um, okay, you've got one now. I have uh, my great honour for displeasure books <laughs> doing the personalisation of gender in Lancashire oh, uh, from what they call the community pathway which is um, all the sort of voluntary, community, and uh, base sector organisations. I mean, I work for a user-led organisation, which is led by the users mm. on the board. But um, effectively, you're absolutely right. What it's caused is like, I'm kind of picking <coughs> in the middle. Like, I'm trying to, at the moment, commissioning these small organized community grassroots organisations to do the work, but they all feel that everyone's stabbing each other in the back because they're all completely fighting for resources. Mm -hmm. And also, it's a, I mean, I work specifically with disabled people, mental health users, people with learning disabilities. But um, what's actually happening is the fragmentation of, they're cutting um, budgets as well, because this allows them social care budgets under assessment. But what also happens is the, the service user, um, it, the service is so fragmented that doesn't appear to be any accountability for that individual that will then be buying in the services and therefore then less likely, for example, to join a lobby group like the disability movement, etc. So they've got very little recourse to, to campaign for, for what should be their sort of financial right to be able to live mm -hmm. like anybody else. So, um, right. Yeah, um, well, one thing I didn't sort of go into as much in, in the talk is, is how messy the personalisation agenda could be. So um, imagine you've got a sheltered housing scheme with I don't know, however many residents. Uh, it used to be that all the support was provided by that one organisation and that, that way it, it leads to a bit more uh, consistency and that one member of staff will know a bit about what else is going on. But if you've got a, a sheltered housing scheme where the, the, the tenants or customers, I suppose I should call them these days, are receiving support from half a dozen different agencies, then there won't be anything to necessarily tie it all together. So it could be that 
the, the service user tells something to one member of staff, but it, which is significant, but it then doesn't get back to another worker. So you're just going to have it, it, it very sort of bitty and messy. That, that's one way I see it happening. Complete happen. mess. Because mm. even the local authority that effectively doesn't even know what can be funded, what can't be funded, etc. And so you get these conflicting ideas when you're supporting an organisation to start learning about how to do support planning effectively. Um, even the local authority doesn't know what the hell it's doing mm. either. So mm. these plans keep coming back. But I mean, for example, disabled people have always been used as a, it's called the disability industry, to make money anyway. Mm. So whoever makes it money out of them, it's the same as any other charity. Yeah. Question back. <clears throat> it's actually a, a comment um, which in a sense contains a, a question which you might want to respond to. Um, I'm working for a disability charity in Leeds called uh, Dial Leeds um, on an unwaged basis. Unwaged. Um, I thought your speech was very good, especially your knowledge about a primary care trust, etc, etc, which will go. Um, my knowledge that I've gained working in this charity is that we're stretched in order to do casework, in order to support disabled people. We are stretched in terms of resources, in terms of technology, and in terms of people to do it. Um, if you look at the big, uh, the big societies expanded by Cameron and others, he seems to believe that uh, charitable institutions and the private sector is going to come in and cover this. Well, I don't know about the private sector, I've got my doubts about it, as far as if I use uh, Dial Leeds as a model, there is no chance that charitable organisations <coughs> are going to cover this because they're already stretched. So, you know, that's my observation. Um, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that talk as well. And you've got it all. I'm on the other side of the having worked also on from the providing side in sheltered housing and all that sort of stuff but at present for the past 17 years i've been very fortunate in receiving all the different benefits sort of thing that i'm being told that i get the 64 pounds that they dole out every week in a gyro or now it's paid into your bank account you, you have to have a bank account now what i wanted to say was um, in this present climate, climate, with me, it's the relationships between people that's of interest to me for future society. I know about the abusive relationships and the, the crap and all the rest of it that goes on uh, in, a, in a capitalist society, but I'm more interested now we could be more mutual aid and caring for one another without being daft or twee about it, you know, realistic and everything else. But I am aware how, um, like Jude mentioned earlier, now, in 20 years ago, or some time ago, it was like a war trying to get what you are supposed to be entitled to. You had to fight for it, shout at people, the police would be called, you'd be dragged off to court, you'd be back there the next week laughing and joking about it, they telling you it's their job, and you say, well, I was a bit upset, and all the rest of it. All that has now changed. Where so many people are forced into caring work who are not carers. Mm. They are abusive, cruel, wicked, manipulative, horrible people. Absolutely. But they have mortgages. They have cars to pay for. This is capitalism. They've got to live. Um, and I see a lot of that. I hear a lot of it. I mean, I love carers. I am not predisposed that way. I'd love to be, if you know what I mean. But I think it takes a special, not a saint, but some people just have it where they can give that kind word that makes so much difference than a bloody gyro or a cheque or uh, someone else's charity. And there is far too much of that creeping in to this situation. I notice now this splitting the claimants or the customers or whoever you want to call the people who uh, receive these services, there's a sort of the undeserving and the deserving. The, the, uh, Kevin said it earlier, the feckless and the not feckless. The respectable 
working class. They don't use the term working class, but they definitely... There's this sort of attitude creeping in, again, that never went away. And I see it very strongly. What I want to get to and what I want to ask is, we have a sector in capitalism called the third uh, sector, made up of volunteers. Most of these kind-hearted, good people, etc., etc. But like I'm saying, this is being, in my view, taken over by people who just need the money to work. They don't care if you're an old person, they'll kick you to death, they'll steal your savings, they don't care if you're disabled. We, we read about it, we hear about it. And it's a lot more prevalent than I even want to admit. You know, it, it, it spoils the ones who are doing the real caring. But what about the invisible carers? What about the people, the extended families, asylum seekers, call it what you like, who are not getting any support? Um, you know, in fact, being abused most of the time, working for low wages, less than the minimum wage. What about the children who are dealing with drug adult parents? You know, no childhood. There's that group of... Uh, society is growing. There are so many children now looking after parents and it's just terrible what's going on. I don't know what I want to say. I just want to see socialism so the relationships we can start improving. Capitalism is putting us against. It's another wedge between us, this nonsense that's going on with benefits, wages and all the rest of it. I hope I've said something that might make a bit of sense there. Oh. Yeah, one, one thing you said, it reminds me of, um, uh, about, uh, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of people who sort of don't receive support or the problem is getting worse mm -hmm. over, over generations. And, um, I mean, it's a while ago since I last watched uh, Kathy Come Home, you know, the, right. the, the, the yeah. 1960s uh, documentary about, um, about homelessness. But the, the, the way that they made the documentary, they'd also um, sort of in, interspersed it with sort of statistics and uh, some big facts and figures from at the time. And one of them was, oh, I can't remember the, the, uh, the actual figures, but it, it was something like um, homelessness will still be a problem in the 1980s if such and such doesn't happen. Uh, I, I can't remember the exact wording, but the, the, what, what, what this particular um, message meant was that the makers of Cathy Come Home didn't expect homelessness to be a permanent part exactly. of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Uh, but obviously, you know, homelessness is still, you know, just as much of an issue now as it was uh, in the 60s, more so perhaps. But I think these days, you, you don't get people wanting to end homelessness, because then that would take away the market, which a lot of these agencies um, are feeding themselves into. So it's in some organisations' interests for things like drug problems, homelessness, uh, debt, to to be prolonged and continue because otherwise they'd, they'd have no customers. <laughs> so um, capitalism is inbuilt to prolong these kinds of problems. So in a sense, they're, they're not problems for capitalism, they're just another another potential market. Exactly. But is that the whole character has been built on this, mm. you know, since the, uh, the fall of the suffering? Yeah, just um, really to add what you said um, about how they're sort of um, surreptitiously, but you know, getting through the Tory policies, but at the same time issuing glossy brochures which say, you know, investors in people and, uh, and, and stuff like that. And I've seen it in the law centre where I work. Um, basically, the Legal Services Commission, who is legal aid, have now, this is really frightening, taken away um, legal advice for people who've been refused benefits. Now, before, when you got refused, they would come to us and say, I've got an appeal to put in and we can put them in touch with the welfare benefit system who would fight their cause and 99.9% .9 they'd get their benefits. But now that funding's been taken away. Um, the other thing that they're um, quite uh, cleverly doing, that, that's one way of getting the numbers down on benefits. Another thing they're cleverly doing is like, oh, we're throwing money at, at, at asylum, but not immigration. So they're gonna take away the funding for just ordinary immigration cases, but. There's less and less countries now where people are coming from asylum, so that's another way of cutting down. And in the four years that I've worked at this law centre, I've seen such dramatic changes um, where the solicitors, what you said, it's taken them away from their job. They're paper pushers, statistic, um, you know, record keepers, and it's taken them away from helping the people who, should, who they should be helping. But I just find it's... Um, but when you talk to the public about it, they use this public purse thing, you know, and you can't just keep, you know, 
throw money at these services, you know. Um, the other thing that, that actually has happened as well is that the solicitors become cherry pickers of the work and I've just realised what you said about the homelessness. They all want the homelessness cases, but the person with disrepair and it's falling through, it's going to take a long, a, a long time to settle that case. And as the legal aid now will only pay you for cases that are closed, it's actually becoming quite unethical. People are cherry picking the cases, the ones that they'll get paid for quickly, and not the ones that are going to, you know, because we'll be running at a loss. And I just think it's terrible what's happening, and people, most people can't see what's happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, I've, I've been out in, in and out employment for, you know, like about 10, 15 years. And I've seen the changes which are happening within the benefit system. Um, basically, in my area anyway, they uh, amalgamated about three job centres into one. And as a, as a claimant, a job seeker, uh, you really notice the intense uh, atmosphere there. There's a, like, you walk in and um, there's kind of intimidating security comes, mm. <laughs> comes up to you. And I always used to scoff at the idea of me being a customer where I can pick and choose my benefits and, and I think I'll go to that agency. No, no, that one's better. That was quite, always quite amusing to me. Um, but I, I work in the homeless industry as well and uh, we've noticed that, well, it's going to hit um, my particular hostel where there are um, Realign the benefit system, the uh, the um, the housing benefit. We're going to be classified as like private landlords now, and um, it's going to cost us like forty to fifty thousand pounds a year in income. Um, so nobody knows what that's what's going to happen in that. Um, uh, we still get a uh, supporting people's plan, but that will probably come into inspection, you know, due to the likely cuts. <clears throat> um, so, um, what we're doing with this is, um, as a hostel, we're cutting members of staff. Well, we're not. We're, we're operating a policy of minimal staffing. So, you know, two members of staff. So, basically, um, uh, we can't do everything that we want. We can't really support people. We can't take them out. We can't, uh, you know, help them in the same way that we uh, really want to. And uh, plus, you know, when a rumor comes avail uh, comes available, when somebody leaves, all the work is going into that room rather than, you know, other aspects of, you know, um, support work, for example. And um, I was just going to say, we, we get these agencies coming into, you know, our, our work and it's like a marketing ploy. They come in with slides, they come in with nice glossy brochures and all. Everything looks really hunky-dory, absolutely slick operation. And then we start referring um, guys, as we call homeless people. And then you know, they start um, saying, oh, we, don't, we can't take them because they've got a slight you know, alcohol problem. We can't take them uh, because it's going to make our, looks, our stats look very, very bad, you know, because, you know, it's going to skew our stats. And uh, I find, you know, I think this is going to increase in intensity. And uh, what are you saying about, um, you know, people who are in... Um, um, you know, uh, they're receiving, uh, uh, what, what's it, not instability, it's, you know, um, ESI? ESA, yes, um, there, there's a big clamp down in that, you know, and they're getting called in, you know, I know someone, <coughs> 10 year old has been uh, called in um, for quite extensive and invasive, um, you know, interrogation by, um, Doctors. Uh, I knew a guy who needed help to get up even off a chair, and uh, you know it was written down in his um, 
you know, uh, his report, the doctor's report saying, oh, he likes watching telly all the time, refuses to get a job, he's all right, you know. And this took an appeal to get this, uh, um, you know, uh, taken back, you know, get his ESA back and stuff. So I think, you know, they're really intensively hitting these people and it's causing such worry to uh, people with, uh, particularly people, things that are not obvious like mental health problems and stuff, you know, they can pick up a book and stuff, but, you know, who says they're not going to have a panic attack, you know, once a day or something like that. And I'm quite interested in the use of medical staff as well to, um, you know, clinical, kind of, I mean, they've got a policy, do no harm, but it, it doesn't seem to extend to other aspects of their lives, you know, the, the people that they're looking at for their economic and social harm, you know, with how come doctors can, can do this, you know, and, uh, you know, how can it conform to their do not harm, you know, um, their policy almost. Okay, hang on a second. Um, uh, we've got a. Bear with me. I will get round to everyone who's put up their hands. But we've had quite a few people, so I'm, I'm going round in order. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay, it's a gentleman. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, a few years ago, 1988, I suffered a schizophrenic attack or whatever. I was in hospital for four four months. And since then, I've been involved in sort of user-led things, you know, I've been members rep at a day centre that we had. But I've noticed in the last couple of years, the direction seems to be to save money. You know, they've closed day centres, they're closing workspaces, which is a place where people with mental health problems could do a bit of woodwork or pottery or art or whatever. They're closing all these services and they're replacing them with things that you buy, personal budgets. But the trouble with mental health is you've got to be severe and enduring to get a personal budget. So most people will fall through the net. They won't get a personal budget. And if they've got incapacity benefit or DLA, they'll have to use that to buy services. And they're closing all the, all the services down. I mean, we set up our own day centre, which is open three, three days a week. And we're try, trying to combat all this. And for, for years, I mean, I was on committees where they talked about what the services were going to do. And they didn't listen to us because we, we represented people from the day centre and everybody wanted to keep the day centre because it was it was quite a brilliant place really, you know. But I mean, to be honest, I mean, you talked about suicides. I mean, the number of people I've known who have committed suicide with mental health is, is quite high really, you know. And that's going to increase now because there's just not there's just not the safety net say, that there was really, you know. And they're, they're, they're dealing with people's lives here really, you know. And it's, it's not good, really. Yeah. Um, yes, a, a, a few months ago, uh, there was a group of uh, members at uh, annual conference, myself included, who were uh, discussing issues like this with uh, a non-member who was very sceptical about the, uh, the Socialist Party. And I put forward uh, the, 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 the opinion that uh, capitalism, although it's always been uh, vicious and anti-social towards the vast majority of the, uh, the population, although it's always been like that, it's had its particularly uh, pernicious uh, periods uh, in more uh, advanced industrialised countries like this. And by this, I, I mean the, the Victorian age uh, we think of the works of uh, Charles Dickens and how the poor uh, were treated then. A, a type of repetition of the Victorian ethos in which uh, the government has retreat, is retreating from uh, the, the social aspects, welfare aspects, we have seen the dismantlement of large parts of the welfare state. We've seen uh, dismantled, combined 
with uh, uh, the weakening, uh, the even weaker position that trade unions are in now, compared with the situation uh, 30 or 40 years ago, and uh, our people are being thrown onto uh, dog queues, and uh, that this word fecklessness we're hearing uh, a, a lot about now, which of course was a, a piece of terminology that was coined uh, a lot in, in, in the 19th century. Uh, charities uh, have been mentioned quite a lot uh, this morning, and the uh, the larger role that they are they are playing in uh, looking after uh, uh, homeless people, people with drug uh, problems and uh, disability problems. So I, I think this is, uh, and yet we, we, we live in an, in an age of so-called modern technology, the internet, mobile phones and that, and yet it just shows you how bankrupt this capitalist system is. That in, although it, uh, we have had technological uh, advance, in a huge way over the last 20 or 30 years. In some ways, we are replicating or going back to uh, uh, the position uh, which a country like this was in uh, uh, nearly two centuries ago, in the 19th century. Okay, uh, Paddy? Uh, I just want to open that point. Um, I think the difference, the difference we've got nowadays is that there's an awful lot more public accountability, so the state can't get away with just ignoring the problem the way it could have done in previous generations. So what it's done now, through the privatisation program, program it seems to me, is, is, um, is it's into a sort of masquerade, which it uh, involves the, the uh, third sector in as well. Um, it pretends to deal with the problem. By contracting out all the uh, all the uh, um, problems to private companies, they pretend to deal with the solution because remember they're all, they're all accountable and all their all their um, outcomes are audited. <coughs> so they they deal with the problem or pretend to deal with the problem by producing tons of paperwork. So which, as you pointed out, um, uh, might be that the uh, so-called frontline workers like uh, me, I do this sort of things wrong. Spend all the time doing the bloody paperwork, but they're spending the time talking to the people or actually helping in any way. Um, yeah, so they so the paperwork takes up. Um, the masquerade then continues because what then happens is that the, these contractors cheat, they fill, basically. Mm. That's the truth. They're all on the fill. <coughs> it's, it's true of the third sector, it's true of charities as well. And there's no they no option but to fill because they've got to jump through these stupidly high hoops in order to get the contracts in the first place. And they're all they're all at each other's throats to get these contracts, so they're promising the moon on a stick to, to the government um, funders. They can't possibly deliver, so they have to fiddle, they have to cheat. And it's well known that they're all doing this. The, um, the company now who's got the contract for employability, which is the reason I'm getting over them, by the way, uh, so pers personal victory on my part there, <laughs> um, is a company called a for re Emma Harrison yeah. runs a for re yeah. Um, she's good mates with George Osborne, by the way, and David Cameron. Oh, very chummy with them. She was the one who employed that um, that awful fairy job mother on the TV. I haven't watched it. I can not bear it. That's what I do at work. I'm completely not watching her as well, but apparently that was pretty grim. Um, yeah, so she employed her. Well, um, interestingly, A4E, uh, in Harrison's company, has already been fined £60,000 for fraud in part. If you look it up and we not find this out. This is the company that's got the government contract. And um, she's big mates with Osborne. So they all know that it's a game. They know that it just, it's just, all the government's happy as long as it can make a load of speeches, present a load of figures. Um, and the Daily Mail, um, you know, the satire of the Daily Mail, the public are happy as long as they're reading that something's being done. The private companies, they're happy as long as they're getting their, their outcomes in, in quotes, you know, their, their massaged figures. Um, and uh, who, who doesn't get anything out of this is, of course, the, uh, the service users. You know, they, they're just the, the, the end of the food chain. Um, and so they, they go through all these different services 
get nothing out of it, go to the next service, get nothing out of that, go to the next service. They, they spend their whole career mm. sort of so, well, I'm all circling the drain. That's right. Because that's all they have. And you see, when you work in this industry, you see the same people over and exactly. over. Exactly. And you, because you're all short contract, you keep moving jobs. So you guys have a different job. Um, lo and behold, it's all the same people again. Exactly. Right? <laughs> exactly. Oh, you're in. Oh, yeah, you're yeah, right. That's what you're saying. It's just joke, yeah. And, um, it's like the industry. <laughs> who come into the industry, who really genuinely believe that he's, they're really trying to work hard. They're the ones who suffer, because they're trying to do all this stupid amount of paperwork, but it's just a load of nonsense, and do the work properly. They, they're the ones who, who burn themselves out, and then of course they'll leave the industry because they just can't stand it anymore. Um, so yeah, I think it's all, it's all capitalism's game. It's, it's, it's a strategy for not dealing with the problem, but pretending that it is. <laughs> um, yeah, just to sort of uh, uh, build on what you say, um, uh, where, where I work, um, with the sort of the massaging outcome figures, that, that, that sort of uh, um, hits hit home. And uh, what, one of the things we've monitored is uh, eviction rates from, from where I work, so the, the number of people who are evicted for, for entries. And there's always a drive to keep those figures down because, you know, it, it looks bad if people are getting evicted. So um, we've got, I'm, I'm guilty of it myself actually. I'm, it, you know, it's like peer pressure sometimes. You, you, you say things that you'd sooner not if you're in more uh, enlightened company. But we, we're trying to reduce the, uh, um, with, with, with the eviction figures. We'd say, oh, so and so, he was evicted today for rent arrears. But oh, I, I seem to remember hearing him saying something about moving to some friends. Oh, is that right? Yes, yes. Oh, he's moved to some friends. He hasn't really been evicted. That was just a coincidence that he would have been evicted if he didn't move into the friends. Whether or not he really moved in with friends is irrelevant in a way because. You know, as long as what goes on the paper is, is, a, is a more positive thing than an eviction. So, um, yeah, that, 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 that hits home. And uh, I suppose with what, what you're saying about sort of seeing people again in, in, in a different service, they, they could have had two positive outcomes. They had left one service, <laughs> um, the, the figures were massaged for a positive reason for leaving the service. Then they see them again, um, feel the figures again. It's two positives for the price of one, everyone's a winner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Uh, I've listened to all the doom and gloom about even with the comments, the poor suffering, and those suffering the most are going to be made to suffer again. But there's two sides to every story. I don't believe a problem exists that hasn't got an answer. There's no guarantee that you'll find it. <coughs> I'd like to think in these terms. If you pick half a dozen of these people that are suffering, or if you pick a hundred, put them all in a room and put the socialist case to them. You'll find they're all objective to socialism for all the different reasons you've heard many, many times before. So they support the system that's causing their suffering. So my attitude to that is, if that's the cause, fuck them, let them suffer. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be a lot plainer. <laughs> <laughs> Do I just come back on that? Yeah. I, mean, uh, I suppose if, if that were the case, uh, it, it could be that... Well, it, that is a case. Right. Um, <laughs> it could be if the, those people might be more preoccupied by their immediate um, situation and they might see it as a sort of an extravagance to start, start thinking about wider sort of political or economic issues. Uh, a lot of people would be sort of focused on sorting themselves out with their I don't know, homelessness or drug problem or lack of work. And they, they would see it as, you know, oh, I haven't got the time to think about the, the deeper reasons behind that. You know, you have to focus with what's right there in front of you. Yes, just something that came up to my mind when you were talking about it. Uh, you haven't mentioned it, I think, um, is the fact that housing benefit, for those lucky to get it, after they've gone through the Inquisition, uh, is going to be paid directly to them, whereas in the past it has been paid to the landlords. Now, I'm saying this because I'm involved in an ALMO which administers about 59,000 or so properties, uh, flats, uh, houses, masonettes, um, warden uh, city accommodation, for a large midland city anyway. I'm a volunteer and so I can't pay for that. But they are very worried now because they figure out that a lot of people will not, instead of paying their rent, they um, will 
So not do it, they'll use it on other things, and we understand why without going into it. Uh, but the Almo then has the responsibility of getting the rent or evicting them. So there may well be a lot more people evicted from their homes. And it's going to be a major problem. It's going to impact on the organisations you were talking about, voluntary organisations, which cater for or try to cater for the homeless. Uh, the, the only one of those I know, a friend of mine works in one, uh, um, Manual House in Nottingham. It um, has a couple of large places where they house homeless. They have eight full-time staff. They have now, all but two of them, been served with notice. And unless they can get the funds from somewhere, they're going to be out of the job. And so, I, don't know, I mean, so it's like the, um, it's going to the problem is likely to get worse rather than better. And I think this is, I mean, so with all the talk about social housing, people who need social housing will be thrown out of it. Mm. Uh, um, well, I wasn't going to say that, but I want to say the, the opposite to what uh, 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 Fred has said. I mean, I don't want to hark back to the good old days of the 60s and 70s again, but in, in those days when unemployment started to rise, the unemployed organised themselves into claimants, uh, claimants unions. Which would be, I mean, so rather than seeing well, these people are victims, but as clients, as users, and so on, what would be the social status? Should, should we be encouraging these people to organise into claimants' unions and trying to exert some sort of collective pressure? Um, you know, I mean, that, that would be something akin to, to trade union action, but we could, we could say something socialist about this. You know. Don't we have claimants' unions anymore? I've never heard of one. I, was, I, hope, I hope Fred wasn't being serious, by the way, because... Uh, oh, it's been very serious. Of course serious. he was. <laughs> 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 Fred was going to set up an experiment. If you want to put this, <laughs> this <laughs> building yeah, yeah. for half a dozen families that are suffering, I'll be quite... Half a dozen families are suffering, but you give the same answer. Mm -hmm. Half a dozen families are suffering, which would say, oh, look, no, it might just be that half of the family who aren't worth. So, I mean, it's not fair to think of the half of the family who are suffering. But the people, uh, somebody uh, on the party's um, uh, uh, mailing list, uh, somebody was um, saying that they were going to uh, produce a leaflet to, to give to people going into job centres. Well, fine, you know, it's a fantastic thing to do in a way, but uh, what struck me is, are these the right people to be giving leaflets to? Because, uh, Look, what these people are going to be thinking about is how they're going to survive to the end of the day, or mm -hmm. the following day, or to the end of the week. They're the last people, it seems to me, to whom it's going to be fruitful to put the socialist case. Can't blame them. They're in a terrible situation, a much worse situation than most people. I mean, as somebody said in an article that was in the Standard some time ago, the reason why that you know, you're not going to get a re revolution in a depression is that most people are actually still in work. Most people are, you know, 80% of the population are still in work. They may be sort of feel precarious, but they're in work, and then they're glad to have that work. So it's only a minority you want. It's a relatively small minority you want, despite the fact that there are large numbers of people. Mm -hmm. and, and, and those people are the least likely to, to be impressed by the socialist case in those circumstances. So, I mean, was Fred being serious? I hope he wasn't. He was. All right, maybe he was, but he's got all the wrong end of the stick. That's he's got I'm a saying. point as well. Um, uh, I'm gonna, we, we've still got three people who want to, to, to speak. I, I have one eye on the time at the moment, because obviously we want to have a bit of a break before the next, uh, um, the next talk. But this obviously is, is something that people feel deeply about. So um, the, the, next, uh, the next three people who've already put their hands up, could I ask you to, to try and uh, just be relatively brief about this, please? Uh, Fraser, Nick. Yeah, um, to answer Adam's uh, point here, there is a few organisations um, called London uh, Coalition Against Poverty, the uh, Edinburgh Coalition Against Poverty, and uh, Glasgow Coalition Against that's G -cap, L -cap and E -cap. <laughs> Anyway, they organise um, leafleting campaigns, they help advice uh, and help for claimants. Um, 
particularly against A for E because um, they're involved with a lot of uh, workfare uh, projects. Mm -hmm. um, so they get all these um, benefit claimants have been there. They train them up for uh, for uh, some kind of very poor work, you know, minimum wage, even more than minimum wage, um, and voluntary. Um, and uh, we advise uh, people how they can get around this, and it's quite interesting. They use uh, one of the ways to get out of it is to use the um, the laws against um, uh, sharing information without your knowledge, so you just don't give them any, any, um, you know, any signature or anything to let them do it. Um, and uh, just about the press point, yeah, I, I think uh, the uh, homeless people, you know, they're such a diverse uh, uh, minority, and it's it's very very hard to actually generalise. I mean, you get. Uh, uh, drug, drug, addict, drug addicts, heroin addicts, uh, alcohol uh, abusers, and stuff like that. But you almost you know, get other people who are just being kicked out by the wife and uh, girlfriend or partner or whatever. You know, on their own, on their crisis of their lives. You know, I mean, uh, so throw them out into a flat or whatever, get a job. You can become a you know normal working class person again. So you know. I don't think there are, you know, some people have got a jail mentality, but you know, a lot of jail mentality is around in, uh, in society. Okay, so, Dave, do you want to say something? Me? No, sorry, Dave, you, you had your hand up. David, in the back? Um, I must have a third hand then. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it was you, Dave, yeah. Okay. Right, Th this answer uh, regarding that they've got too much on their plate, so therefore they can't understand socialism. You can apply that to the vast majority of people in the world. Mm. But the fact is, and it's a sad fact, that the only answer to all the problems is socialism. All the reforms have been tried over and over and over again, as you <coughs> well know. And unfortunately, it's the only answer. And if they can't accept that, then the, the, the there, there won't be socialism. Mm -hmm. I'm not just referring to those people that are down and out, but the vast majority of people. And here we had, we had a, 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 a royal parasite got married a few months ago. Trafalgar Square was absolutely packed with these mm. morons. Yes. Waving the flag. <laughs> yeah. and yeah. Yeah. To, 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 to the ecstasy to see it in their eyes oh, no, when they see the agony coming along. Sickening. They're going to display the wedding dress. And millions of people all over the world want to see this bit of fabric, you know? This is their, their attitude, and unfortunately, until it changes, you're going to have all these, these problems. <laughs> yeah, in response, in response to your first comment, I work, um, actually, I, I class myself as a disabled person anyway, but I work with people that, because of the cuts, to um, and the reprioritization of who can get services, you know, they're very unlikely to engage with socialism because some of them can't even get out of the house. Mm -hmm. um, some of them, um, but I've been looking at some of these support plans, and they're you know they're only allowed to have a wash once a week, and uh, that woman who, because she isn't incontinent, is expected to wear incontinence pads all night because she. They won't uh, give us support to get out of bed in the evening. Things that were, um, yeah. were unthinkable just two years ago. That's how bad it is. We are returning to a Victorian model, but that was clear under Blair that we were returning exactly. to a Victorian model. The farming everything out to the third sector, and the third sector, I work for the third sector. At least I, run, I work for a user-led organisation that is run by the people it serves. Um, but the third sector is as cutthroat as any other sector. Mm and it's, have to, it's been forced to be as cutthroat. Okay, the people might go in there, such as social workers. It's just an amelioration of the system. So I agree, socialism is the only answer. But I think there are a lot of people who can't engage with socialism because actually physical um, barriers in their way, like <coughs> to go to the toilet. And that's what's happening. 
Hang on. I'll go on. Okay, I've got two, two, um, two, two, two more people want to speak. Can, can you please keep it brief? Paddy first. Very briefly. I Sorry? Think, uh, very briefly. Yeah. I think that blaming the poor uh, for their ignorance is the same as blame, blaming the wife for the wife beater. Mm. Okay. Well said. People have been on the branch. Very disabled, and he writes a letter to me about his Jews. He stole that big, big letter. He, he's, he's very disabled, but he's a member of the Socialist Party. And he, when we realised what the situation was, we waived his Jews because, quite obviously, he's on benefits and that because he's disabilities. But he seems quite capable of understanding the Socialist case, and he's a member of the Casual Branch. So there are people, and he's quite severely disabled. Who are quite able to do both, to struggle in this society and still become socialists. Okay, and, and I would just like to make a very quick point. I, I think there, there is danger of focusing on the idea that the present crisis might, might actually be responsible for the cuts, and certainly things are getting a lot worse as a result. But I think I'm always reminded that uh, when uh, supporting people uh, was first mooted by the government in 2001, the primary focus even at that point, was saving money. Um, before that point, what would happen was that any independent organisation could set up the support scheme, and if they could get a single determination from housing benefit, then they could actually draw down housing benefit. It was when uh, Hallett Wellen and Hatfield Council decided to go to court to say that uh, housing benefit should not be paying for support, that the government started to look at this, and it introduced a new system supporting people, whereby individual uh, services were contracted to the government uh, to provide services so that instead of an open-ended funding, so as many services could be set up as, as they liked, the government then would have an established pot. And every local authority, I was engaged with the introduction of, social, of supporting people, socialism, with that, if only that the case, um, I was uh, involved with the introduction of supporting people, and every local authority that I approached were, were absolutely cynical at that point because they realised that although we started off with a pot which actually represented um, what uh, services were cost, cost, costing at that point, they would immediately start being reduced by the government. So even when it was introduced in 2003, um, the, uh, the, the, the figures, the amount of money that was actually going to be available um, was started to be reduced in, in my area. It was being reduced at the rate of 3% per year. Now, of course, it's been reduced at 11%. So um, even even without the... Uh, without the um, uh, uh, the crisis, the present crisis, uh, the government was obviously, as it always is, uh, focused on, on saving money for what it calls the public, likes to call the public purse. Okay, that's my, uh, that's my uh, topic's worth. Um, Mike, do you want to sum up, please? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, um, just um, a couple of people made, uh, made points that we're, sort of, in their view, we're returning to sort of a 19th century kind of situation, and, uh, and someone else mentioned that, you know, all the reforms have been tried and and, and haven't worked. Um, the, the, the point I was trying to make, which um, maybe just to, to reiterate, was that although the, the scale of the problem might be sort of approaching again what it was like in the 19th century, although perhaps we're now a bit more aware of things like disabilities or mental health problems than you know, our 19th century counterparts were. Uh, so although the scale of the problem might be similar, I don't know uh, if the number crunch would bear that out, but um, the point I was trying to make, that the increasing sort of commodification and commercialisation of the support sector is, is sort of a new reform that they're trying um, to, to use to sort of deal with the, the issue by sort of assimilating it more into mainstream capitalism. I mean, you know, we've already talked before about um, how, um, how, how, the, the, how these organisations, whether private um, companies or, or charities or housing associations, is, is in their vested interest for these problems to persist within capitalism. And um, I think what <laughs> what the difference is between now and the 19th century is that everything's becoming a bit more sort of institutionalised in, in a different way. It's, um, it's becoming much more corporate, yeah, maybe that's the best word, in that, uh, that the whole support industry is going the same way as the, the rest, of the, rest of the economy, and it's becoming much more sort of commercialised, it relies on glossy advertising, um, you know, number crunching, and that, that to me is the, the difference between now and in the 19th century. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of the only other point I wanted to make. Um, also, as well, the, um, the kind of um, situation that I've explained in my talk and also that we've gone on into the discussion, if, if you want to 
know a, a bit more about that in a bit more detail, there's a, a free book available, um, uh, as there was last year, which is a, a, a novel set in a, in a homeless hostel, which um, the, the, well, I'll talk, sort of, try to sort of give the context of the situations at the moment. So if you want to see how this kind of situation with benefit cuts, funding cuts, increasing commercialisation of the of that sector um, affects uh, fictional characters, not, not real ones, but fictional ones, then um, uh, give us a shout and I'll give you a copy of the book. Uh, it, it's, it, it's, it might not be to everyone's taste. It, uh, some, of the, <laughs> some of the situations in it are, 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 are described quite unpleasant. Uh, quite unpleasantly, and uh, the, the language is quite foul, so don't, don't read it. Oh, lovely. Can I put that health warning, uh, not suitable for children or those of you with a nervous disposition. But yeah, if you want to, uh, if you want to, uh, to read something else which will uh, depress you even more than our talk, then uh, give, us, give us a shout afterwards. Thank you.